at the bottom of your screen to comment or ask questions. Also kindly note that this webinar is recorded. If you're uncomfortable, please, you can leave the webinar. To kick start us off uh, with some welcoming and opening remarks, let me welcome UNESCO's regional advisor and team leader for education for health and well-being, Dr. Patricia Machawira. Patricia leads a team at UNESCO implementing regional work on education for health and well-being and supports the East and Southern Africa region. Welcome, Patricia, and over to you. Please confirm if you can hear me and see me. Loud and clear, and yes, we can see you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, the Honorable Director for Guidance and Counseling, Ministry of Education from the Kingdom of Eswatini, welcome Director Lindewin, respected government partners from across Sub-Saharan Africa, our esteemed guests this morning, dear teachers, UN and civil society partners that are joining us this morning, young people, uh, our partners from the media and the all three um, team members. So Remy, I know that the chat is enabled, is disabled, but it may be good if participants are able to add their names to the chat so that we know who is in the room. So this morning, UNESCO is pleased to unveil this important initiative the launch of the Connect and Learn, a Sub-Saharan Africa regional community of practice to support teachers so that they can enable young people to build strong foundations for their lives, which is a project of collaboration amongst ministries of education, society organizations, and UNESCO across uh, the East and Southern Africa region. Um, we know that our region, Sub-Saharan Africa, is the most youthful region, with 70% of our population being under age of 30. So while we've seen significant progress in improving the health and well-being of young people, we also know that our people continue to face many challenges and they bear disproportionate burden of poor sexual and reproductive health outcomes, such as high HIV infections, early and unintended pregnancy, child marriage, gender-based violence, and limited access to sexual and productive health um, services and information, and also mental health challenges. We've seen that COVID-19 pandemic has also exacerbated these challenges in a lot of our countries by disrupting education for young people and also service delivery. Um, comprehensive sexuality education remains one of the key strategies that we have to address these challenges. CAC provides every child and adolescent with the knowledge, attitudes, and skills that they need to safely navigate significant milestones in their lives. Commitment to provide CSE was strongly affirmed by governments across 11 um, as countries in East and Southern Africa. Uh, who endorsed the commitment on the provision of CSE and services in December 2021. We are still working with um, you know, the regional economic communities to ensure that we get more member states um, endorsing and affirming the ESA commitment. So we do know that effective delivery of comprehensive sexuality education heavily depends on having well-equipped teachers. <laughs> So UNESCO is committed to support ministries of education to strengthen capacities of teachers to deliver CSE through the project, Our Rights, Our Lives, Our Future. So the project aims to improve sexual and reproductive health outcomes for young people across um, sub-Saharan Africa. So with a lot of efforts from UNESCO, from governments and from other partners, we know that many teachers are now confident in delivering CSE, but many of them also need a little bit of fine tuning of their skills through ongoing support and capacity building opportunities. This is particularly important because CSE covers many complex and sensitive topics that are constantly evolving. So this calls for a heightened need for provision of ongoing professional development opportunities for our teachers. This is why we are here today launching the community of practice 
connect and learn. So this community of practice is a platform for you where you are able to share knowledge and experience with other teachers to access useful resources and build your skills and knowledge so that we can better deliver CSE more effectively at classroom level. So I'd like to emphasize that this space is not just for teachers, but also for anyone involved in the delivery in advocacy or evidence generation of CSE and related interventions. Realization of health and well-being of young people cannot be done by schools alone, but needs the support and commitment for family, from community, and from the society as a whole. So today we'll be looking forward to hearing um, from teachers, from civil society partners, on what they expect from this community of practice and how they can contribute. I hope each and every one of you will also use this event to share ideas to make this community of practice useful and vibrant. We need to be directed by you on what, what you want to see and what are your expectations uh, for this community of practice. This crucial work on CSE is only possible thanks to our partnership with governments across Sub-Saharan Africa and our expanding family partners committed to supporting adolescent sexual and reproductive health for adolescents and young people. This vital work is possible with support from our partners um, thanks to Sweden, France, Norway, Switzerland, Ireland, and the Packard Foundation for their generous support. So before I conclude, I want to thank all the government representatives, all the teachers, all the partners, young people, and colleagues who are here today to celebrate this launch event. Your commitment and support to working on the health and well-being of young people is outstanding. Let us remember that empowering adolescents and young people to prevent HIV, to prevent unintended pregnancies, and to eliminate gender-based violence remains our number one priority. Of all, we want our young people to lead healthy and filled lives and safely transition into adulthood. I'm confident that together, with all of you here today, we can support young people to build stronger foundations for their life. I thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia, for the welcome and opening remarks, and really just reminding us of the essence of the community of practice that we are launching today. It was a, a very good connection, perfect Wi-Fi, fantastic video, one would think you were connecting from Zambia. Um, at this point in time, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Ms. Lindy Wenana Tlamini, who holds a master's degree in education, specializing in counseling and human services obtained from the University of Botswana. She is also a part-time lecturer at the University of Eswatini, lecturing human and organizational communication. Ms. Lamini works for the Ministry of Education and Training in the Kingdom of Eswatini as Director for Career Guidance and Counseling. She is responsible for giving strategic leadership on how to comprehensively program for the creation of safe and enabling environment and support the successful transition of learners. Her focus area is HIV prevention, health promotion, gender-based violence prevention, and response and career guidance in the education sector. She's also a board member of REPC. Her passion is keeping girls in school, uh, as well as um, uh, ensuring that menstrual health management as a means of reducing absenteeism and dropouts among school-going girls. I am also her favorite UNESCO colleague. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Ms. Lamini. Thank you very much, uh, Remy, for such an introduction. Uh, Program Director, uh, the Regional Advisor of Education for Health and Wellbeing, uh, UNESCO Eastern and Southern Africa Region. Distinguished um, senior government officials from sub saharan um, Africa, uh, DA teachers, CSOs, young people, 
um, DA UNESCO representatives extinguish uh, gas. It's a very warm greetings from the kingdom of Eswatini, Sanibonani. It is my privilege and honor to have this opportunity to be here to welcome you for this launch of Connect and Learn, a sub-Saharan region, um, a regional community of practice to support young people to build strong foundations for their life. As we have heard from the UNESCO Regional Advisor, comprehensive sexuality education plays a central role in preparation of young people for a safe, productive and fulfilling life in a world where early and unintended pregnancy, HIV and STI infections, violence, gender inequality and mental health challenges among many other issues pose serious risk for, for them. And especially in the time of COVID-19. The Kingdom of Eswatini is fully committed to deliver comprehensive sexuality education for every child and young person, as we affirmed in endorsement of the renewed East and South African ministerial commitment on provision of CSE and sexual and reproductive health services for young people in 2021. In our schools, um, a, we, we provide a significant opportunity to reach a many young people with CSE. In order to leverage such an opportunity, our teachers need to be fully equipped with knowledge, skills, and attitudes for effective delivery of CSE. Thus, together with UNESCO, the Kingdom of Eswatin has been working on capacity building of teachers. However, many of our teachers face various challenges in the classroom. Lack of knowledge, skills, and confidence are some of the biggest uh, bottlenecks in delivery of quality CSE. This makes capacity building of teachers one of our top priorities. This community of practice will complement our efforts to build capacity of teachers by um, facilitating peer exchange and learning among them. I am confident that our teachers um, can greatly benefit from this platform where they can discuss common shared interests and, sh and challenges with teachers from across the continent. As the UNESCO Regional Advisor mentioned, addressing health and well being of young people requires multi stakeholder collaboration. Thus, I am thrilled to see that membership of the community of practice goes beyond teachers. I hope to see cross fertilization of knowledge and experience among diverse stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues, though much has been achieved in teacher preparedness for CSC, many teachers are still waiting to be trained, supported and connected. Together, we need to accelerate our efforts to ensure that all teachers are well prepared and supported to deliver CSC. The Kingdom of Eswatini is highly committed to actively participate in the community of practice and utilize it uh, to the fullest extent. We will encourage our guiding and counseling teachers along with other CSC practitioners to join and actively contribute to the community of practice. We will also be creative in the way we reach the hardest rich uh, teachers. As we celebrate the launch of this community of practice, I look forward to learning from other countries on ideas to make it useful and relevant. I wish great success to this community of practice and all its participants. I wish you a very successful event. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Lamini, for those remarks and for the keynote address. And it's always a pleasure to have you uh, on these uh, events. At this point in time, I'd like to invite the next uh, speaker who's also going to facilitate the next segment uh, of the launch, uh, Sitembile Chiware, who is the founder of a regional consultancy firm, Mayita Group. Tembi and the team at Mayita are supporting UNESCO to establish and manage this community of practice and will be our facilitator today. She has vast experience in managing multi-country and regional donor funded programs and has led several grants such as the Global Fund and CEDA funded programs as principal recipient at UNDP, HIVOS, ICRC and SAFAIDS. She also worked for Frontline AIDS in the UK many years ago and then it, when it was called International HIV AIDS Alliance. She has a double master's in international development from the University of Sussex, focusing on public health issues. Uh, it is my honor to invite you, Tembi, to please take the floor. Many thanks, Rami, and thank you so much, Dr. Patricia Pachalria, and many thanks to Ms. Lindewa Lamini. So thank you so much. I'm going to just give a very short overview of what the community practice is going to be about, and also just really give you a structure, the value addition, and the benefits of joining the community practice, whether as an individual or as an organization. So the community of practice is going to be a regional, a regional space, which comprises of multi-sectorial membership with organizations and individuals in support of adolescents and young people's health outcomes in sub-Saharan Africa. So we welcome different representatives from the teachers, the policy makers, parliamentarians, and also the different civil society organizations and so forth. We also, it will also comprise of monthly webinars. So this is the very first launch and we hope that we can have recurrent regional webinars that we'll be holding on a monthly basis. And we have a mobile application, which we have wide range of features such as the interactive blog and the digital library. And as also we we'll have an online certified C CSE course, which will be accessed via the learning platform and the monthly newsletters. So there'll be different products that will be generated over time. And we hope that this is a very interactive platform that will also go beyond just the webinars. So in terms of value addition for the COP, one of the things that we're really hoping to do is that the regional organization and uh, and the COP will be a space to improve the knowledge dissemination, to facilitate learning and stimulate creativity. So members who have enhanced preparedness in continuous de uh, professional development on CSE issues, the platform will reconnect teachers that have trained on the CSE on online and they were certified, and those that haven't had the certification yet and other key stakeholders involved in the CSE delivery. It will also provide the linkages and opportunities for collaborative strategic and technical projects, build common capabilities in CSE across Sub-Saharan Africa, provide advisory roles on matters relating to CSE. We will have an interactive platform on the mobile app where you can post your questions and the technical teams will be able to respond to those questions and facilitate documentation of promising and innovative practices in the delivery of CSE. So the benefits of joining and being a member of the community of practice are many, but just a few that I'm going to allude to. You have access to exclusive resources we will have a digital library that will host quite a number of documents. And we hope that you can also visit such as policy positions, curriculum for the teachers, learning plans, and also news, newsletter articles, and even the upcurrent news that are coming from the different countries in regards to the CSE. You also have access to the webinars in informal virtual discussions access to online forums where members can question and share ideas and experience. 
access to connect with other CSE practitioners around the region and abroad also, access to opportunities to contribute or feature in the monthly newsletter. So we are going to be inviting quite a number of participants and those that are willing to post articles and experiences that are finding at community level and we will be publishing them through the monthly newsletters. So this is a very interactive space where we hope that we can also get quite a number of um, submissions. And the membership card with a unique identification number and a certificate of membership. So once you join the community of practice, you receive a unique identification number and also the certificate for membership. Over to you, Rami. Uh, thank you so much, Tembi, for giving us an uh, overview and how the community of practice uh, will be functioning. Uh, we're really looking forward. Uh, let me see if there are any questions in the Q&A. Uh, let's see. Uh, IT colleagues, let me know if uh, there is any question. Okay, I see the questions have been answered. Uh, I think, uh, how does one join the community of practice? Uh, this Tembi has spoken to. Avec um, Lambda Conference. There's a question in French. Uh, uh, Florence, can you please uh, try and respond to it uh, on, on the chat? Great. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so let's move on now to the second segment uh, of the launch, which is uh, a panel discussion uh, with CSE practitioners. And for this, again, I'll invite uh, Stembile to chair and to facilitate the panel. Over to you, Tembi. Thank you so much, Remy. We do have quite a number of our distinguished guest speakers. We're very excited to be having them on online and they are coming from different countries in the region. So we are very much excited to be having them on this space. So allow me to introduce our distinguished guest speakers. So there are five of them and four of them are from the educational sector. So we're very excited about that. So we do have four from the education sector and one from the civil society organization at regional level. So I want to welcome Ms. Anne Okuburu, a teacher who is based in Uganda. So Ms. Anne is a teacher for the past 26 years. She teaches biology and has passion in ensuring learners leave school well equipped with the accurate information and skills to manage their bodies and make informed decision about their sexuality. So it's very relevant that she's teaching biology and she has really impacted the community uh, in Uganda. So we welcome you, Ms. Anne. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And we also have Mr. Brian from Rwanda. So Mr. Brian Mugisha, is also a teacher and works as a trainer by supporting pre and in service teacher development. He has impacted the communities in Rwanda in the sense that he has almost uh, trained almost 400 teachers in Yamasheke district in the west of Rwanda. So welcome, Ms. Mugisha. Our next speaker is Ms. Regine. Ms. Regine Akaleku Mutima is also a teacher in Rwanda. They are together with Ms. Mugesha. So Ms. Regine has been a teacher for 18 years in Rwanda and has contributed a lot to the CSE across the different schools. She established 36 hop clubs in different schools and has published a school paper called The Angels Ubuntu where she's also talking about the CSE. And our last teacher is representing Malawi from Malawi, Miss Wizi, Miss Wizi Kacheche. 
She's an education specialist in the Ministry of Education in Malawi and is a teacher on life skills education at Lupaso Secondary School. So welcome. Thank you. I'm Regine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are Thank you. We are also joined at regional level by Mr. Kelvin Ngoma, the country director of REPS. So REPS rep, uh, means Regional Psychosocial Support Initiative. So Mr. Ngoma is well accredited in, in social and emotional skills as a formidable tool for providing CSE to adolescents and young people. So Mr. Ngoma is a social development expert with over 20 years experience and has initiated and managed school and community-based projects in Malawi, Namibia, and Zambia. So welcome, Mr. Ngoma. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Great, thank you. So we do have a series of questions that we want to be asking you, and we're giving you a maximum of three minutes each to respond to the questions. In the interest of time, we hope that you can also make them short and precise because we want to give a bit of space for other participants as well to input towards the end if there's any other questions. So I want to start with uh, Miss Anne in Uganda. Why is it important for teachers to understand sexual development for effective CSE? Thank you, Zempi, uh, for that question. I'm Anne, as already introduced, I teach biology. Uh, it's important for teachers to understand the development of sexuality because teachers spend much more time with these learners than their parents. Out of 12 months, we have about nine months with these teachers, I mean the adolescents, while the parents may have only three months. Therefore, it means the role of bringing up a child who has developed skills that are closely linked to effective social and emotional learning, self-awareness, self-management, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making lies in the hands of this teacher. A teacher may be considered the second parent of the child after the biological parents who actually hand them over to us just when they're three years old. They speak into their lives about almost everything from social, spiritual, biological involvement, uh, changes, relationships, and academics. So a, a child grows practically in the hands of this teacher. A child learns to trust the teacher even more than parents who usually may have busy jobs, schedules whereby they are away for most of the times. And some also do not um, think of their closeness to the, to, the, to the learner to impact in their lives. However, the teacher is the one who has most of the time to change the attitude of this child over whatever she experienced in her development or his development life. Therefore, the teacher has to be equipped with information that can help this child to grow, to be assertive, and live life skills that can make him uh, or her to be independent. But without that knowledge being given to the teacher, then she will not be able to accord this to the learner. So besides, who is a teacher? We know a teacher is a person who helps students to acquire knowledge, competence, and all virtue. How will the teacher then deliver this knowledge or competence, values, skills that this child needs to grow up wholesome, to be a responsible person, to make right decision. How will the teacher then deliver that knowledge, which includes among other things, such scientifically accurate information for this sexual education about the human development, anatomy and productive health, as well as information about contraception, about uh, childbirth and sexual transmitted infections, including HIV. So most teachers in secondary schools either lack this information or those who have it, for example, those who teach biology, yes, they teach it as a, a subject, but do not take it to the level where it is deliberately going towards making the learner understand herself or himself and grow into a person who will uh, hold the world in a different view. These bodily changes, 
protecting sexual productive health must be pertinent in their life. And this must be imparted by this teacher. So the teacher must be equipped with all this information as a classroom teacher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Anna. Mr. Mr. Mungesha, are you on the line? Are you on the line? Right. Allow me to move to Ms. Wazi. Uh, Ms. Is there. Uh, I'm there as a regime. I think uh, Mujisha is not, uh, uh, I don't know if she, he's, uh, he can answer, but I'm there. We are not in the same place. That's okay, that's, that's okay. So we can proceed, it's fine. So the team can maybe check on Mr. Mungisha. May I allow me to move to Ms. Wesley? I wanted to ask what could be the barriers for implementing CSE in schools? Ms. Wesley in Malawi. Thank you, Tembi, for giving me this opportunity to share on some of the barriers to implementation of CSE in schools. Uh, first of all, I wanted to clarify that in Malawi, CSC is provided as a standalone subject known as the life skills education. So whenever I mention life skills education, I'm referring to CSC. So one of the challenges that I have faced as a secondary school teacher when it comes to implementation of CSE in classroom situation is that of teaching mixed age classes. You know, CSE is a curriculum based teaching and learning process aiming at providing age appropriate content. The assumption here is that uh, learners with different age groups have different needs and experiences. So my challenge is that uh, in my school, most of the classes that uh, I teach are composed of mixed ages. And the majority in those classes, they are above 16 years. For instance, the form one class that I'm teaching now, 60% uh, of the class is over 16 years. And yet the expectation is to have learners within the age group of uh, 14 to 15 years. Now, the challenge comes in uh, when it comes to teaching. For me to find the middle ground uh, for all learners to benefit from my lessons, it becomes a challenge. It even becomes more challenging uh, in terms of choosing the right or selecting the right content and information for all learners to benefit. Another challenge which I've experienced is that of achieving comprehensiveness when it comes to teaching uh, comprehensive sexuality education. You know, it takes a curriculum, well-trained teachers and even policies for good quality CEC to be achieved. But from my experience, I have noted that it's very difficult to achieve comprehensiveness because of a number of reasons. I'll only share a few. One of them is that from my understanding of CAC, sexuality is an integral element of comprehensive sexuality education. However, I have noted that many of us teachers did not study sexuality in the uh, college. And because of that, uh, we, we, we demonstrate knowledge gaps when it comes to teaching some of the elements of sexuality. You know, sexuality is blood and the, it, it encompasses a number of difficult terminology. And the, the content around it keeps on developing because of the emerging issues. Now, if I am, as a teacher, I, am, I don't have broad understanding of what sexuality is about, sometimes I do struggle uh, to provide uh, the effective uh, sexuality education lessons. Uh, another challenge here in Malawi is that um, we have limiting policies and gaps in the life skills education that we have when it comes to comprehensive sexuality education. Uh, recently, uh, in my Form 1 class, when I was teaching about the physical development, one learner asked me to explain the difference between a gay person and a queer person. And another one asked me to describe how a condom can be used. But as a teacher, I failed to provide convincing uh, response to this learner or these learners because these are policy issues in Malawi. And yet our learners are exposed to a wide range of information which they get over the social media. And this information might be age appropriate or not. 
And sometimes what they get is not incorrect information. So when they get confused with this information, they bring the, that confusion or those issues into a classroom, expecting us teachers to provide facts. Unfortunately, we cannot provide all the facts because we are limited in terms of what information to provide to the learners uh, in terms of the policies and the, what we are provided for in our country. And lastly, I just wanted to share that here in Malawi, another issue which I'm experiencing as a teacher in terms of achieving comprehensiveness is that life skills education in secondary school is an option subject. It means learners are at the liberty of dropping the subject at any level. Now for us to reach comprehensiveness is difficult because life skills, the expectation is to provide in terms of uh, CSE, the expectation is to provide uh, CSE as a package to learn. So if they drop that subject before they finish, uh, the second the society, it means some elements, uh, they miss some elements of comprehensive sexuality. And the, most of the learners, they are dropping the subject because to them it is perceived as a, not a university subject. And there are a lot of misconceptions around this sexuality education. So parents even force some learners to drop it despite doing well in class. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wazi. And the barriers that you have just alluded to are some of the conversations that we're going to be having in the COP to see how we're going to be addressing them as well. So I want to invite Ms. Regine from Rwanda. Can you share with us the benefits of joining the COP and uh, mm -hmm. that we have uh, attended earlier? And from the teacher's perspective, what specific That's expectations do you have for the community okay. practice? Okay, thank you so much, Tembi. Um, I think that uh, to have this COP will uh, help me and the other teachers uh, especially me, I will just gain a lot of knowledge about CSE. Uh, as I told you, I have been working in CSE alongside a long time ago, uh, like uh, 18 years I'm a teacher, but I created a, uh, a newspaper that is uh, in schools that is free and uh, on my salary. I used to, to cut off some money and uh, go and print some information for students. Uh, so I'm just display, displaying uh, information, but uh, uh, to have a team that I work with uh, about CSE will help me to gain more knowledge about the subject so that I can just display the, the real information and the needed information. Then um, that's one. Second, uh, it will be a very, very uh, good opportunity for me and for uh, the teachers uh, cohort uh, that we can uh, share uh, information and talk about it freely because uh, as teachers also, uh, we are still having this uh, cultural bar barriers and uh, we fear to talk about CSE in the public, to share information. We blame those uh, kids, those girls to get pregnant early, but uh, what, what are we doing to, to help them not, not be uh, pregnant? So it's time for us to make it as easy to break the, the stone and to talk about it. So it will be uh, helpful for us to also reach to the student. If we are easy in talking uh, about CSE, and uh, in gaining information, in displaying the information, it will be also easy to share information with uh, the kids, with the girls, the boys. It will be very easy. We are working with adolescents and they need us uh, to be strong enough, to have enough knowledge, to have enough power uh, on uh, managing themselves. Uh, so it will be um, a good opportunity for us to, 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 to break that fear of uh, uh, sharing that information and talking about it. Uh, I think also um, uh, in uh, this uh, platform, in this COP, uh, we are having different countries. And uh, sure, we need to know the situation everywhere in Africa. Uh, 
uh, we need to know what can we do? What can we do uh, to fight against different uh, problems we are having? Uh, early pregnancies in Rwanda, it's a very serious problem. Like uh, I told you last time, uh, we are having, uh, last year we had had 23,000 uh, girls who got pregnant, early pregnancies under 18. Before 2021, in 2020, we had uh, 20,000 of girls. 19, we had 17. 18, we had 17 and so on. So you see that we have a very big number of uh, early pregnancies. Not only that, when we look at uh, HIV, uh, the increase of the rate of HIV in youth is very high. But what can we do? If I share something with uh, Malawi teachers, uh, uh, if I share uh, something with the Ugandan teachers, I will have the whole situation and then we know what to do, what they have done. Then I will also implement it here. I will apply uh, the techniques they have used here, or I will give the, the techniques that we are using so that they can use it. So uh, the expectations are very many. Uh, I think, yeah, I can stop there, maybe. Allow me, allow me to add on what uh, my sister Regina has just talked about. Thank my you. name is Brian. I'm very sorry. I came late because of the internet problems. I work in a refugee in Rwanda, I'm also a teacher. But in the book, in the, in the, in the fact, in the fact case, I was supposed to discuss why CSP is close, but let me just supplement on what Regina has just said, that when we look at the, at the image about sexuality, people are still blind or ignorant about what it is, even the adults. So I was conversing with some students and teachers at one of the schools called Yes, yes You Can Remember, and that's ah, what, when you feel a disease, like flu, or you feel pain in your body, what do you do? Then they are giving me relevant answers. Then I said, what happens when you have feelings or when you have emotions with sex? What do you feel? Then they are saying, if I'm an adult, if I'm an adult, if I'm an adult I will going to play sex. That was a child in senior too. And I just laughed. So meaning that most of the population here in Rwanda, especially in Rusizi, they don't know that the difference between sexuality and the sex. And also they think that everything, when you talk about sex, it means sex intercourse. And they don't know that how do we control, how do they control their emotions for the sex? How do they control their behaviors and uh, their personality once they feel such emotions? So I think that the, what this, this platform is good for us is to not only stop here, but we can always share experiences and how we can also help the society to understand that sexuality is not all about teaching about sex, but helping our young children to understand the concept of sexuality and how it can help them in their growth development. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mr. Brian. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you were able to join us. And I want to welcome all the participants that are still joining the webinar. We invite you to share your comments and also your experiences in the chat box. Feel free to share any questions as well so that at least we can respond to them during the webinar or maybe thereafter in the community of practice. So Mr. Brian, I'm very glad that you managed to join. And thank you so much, Ms. Regine, for also sharing your perspective. I want to invite Ms. Anne back again from Uganda. And just to share, ask you the last question that I have for you, Ms. Anne, are you on the call? Yes, please. I'm on the okay. <laughs> okay, so how can we how can we demystify the misconceptions surrounding this uh, sexual education within our communities? How can we demystify it? Mm. Thank you, Madam Tempe. Yeah, in Uganda, first of all, I also want to uh, remind us that we did not choose the the comprehensive sexual education, but we chose 
Sexuality Education. Um, Uganda developed and launched the National Sexuality Education Framework in 2018, but a number of accusations continue to be made limiting SE implementation in Uganda. This is largely due to inadequate information and misconceptions around SE. Teachers can play a major role in demystifying this. One, teachers should have the right information on SE by receiving trainings appropriately and the curriculum is rolled out in schools with a clear time frame or timetable. Then through the following interventions, teachers can demystify these uh, misconceptions stated below, above. Uh, these are consistency in providing accurate information based on and demonstrating the existing facts on data on un unwanted pregnancies, STIs and HIV, teenage pregnancy and sexual behavior patterns of young people comparable with how the school has achieved in changing the behavior of the students. The other stakeholders will then use that information to accept the positives of the program. If they have not seen it, once we do not roll out and start it to that level, then we shall continue having problems with them. But we can demystify this if we can bring on board correct information in time. And as they begin receiving, their minds will change. Mm -hmm. Training parents. Parents are the key people who should, first of all, have taken charge of the sexuality education. However, we see many parents uh, do not have that knowledge. So the parents can easily be trained on what to teach to the children, uh, especially when meetings for parents, teachers associations are organized in the school. This will close the gap of accusation. And so the teachers will be able to uh, disseminate the SE using the school as the reference point. So as we invite parents, of course, some of the parents in the school are also uh, other stakeholders, others can be um, health workers, others can be policymakers. And so as they gather, and then this information is given with uh, the facts which had already been collected, then this will act as a reference to disseminate the, pro, uh, the issue to many others out there. And in the end, people will uh, accept SE as an important component in the lives of these adolescents. Community dialogue is very necessary. This will bring together all stakeholders from policymakers, health sector, parents, political leaders, religious leaders, cultural leaders, to be sensitized about what is involved in the curriculum of SE. And in school, we have that opportunity of creating uh, an opportunity for uh, say a seminar, workshop, whereby you invite these people to come and meet, either uh, after inviting maybe parents and also have some particular classes that are uh, in that age group so that they are trained or, uh, uh, to learn about the truth of what SE is, not as they hear it, it is teaching about sex, it's teaching about children involved, uh, becoming pro promiscuous. Those are the statements that have come. Saying that parents, I mean, uh, the teachers are teaching children oh, through SE to use, to, to use condoms without telling them facts about condoms. Those are some of the misconceptions that people have had. But everything shall be cleared if we can have a community dialogue. Then the school board of governors should be aware of the magnitude and urgency and importance of the program in order to support, protect, and fund it. Because the teachers will not be legally protected if the board of governors do not support the idea. Because this is something which involves use of money. So there's funding and then collecting information from other sources. So if they support the teachers, then through this forum with the teachers, then uh, we can demystify the misconception about SE. Uh, having to train some teachers who may specifically choose to teach SE <laughs> would increase the rate of dissemination about SE programs instead of loading the teachers who are already teaching the mainstream curriculum, which means somehow we are aware that we need to teach these children uh, about their sexuality. However, because we are running the main curriculum, time allocated for that guidance and counseling is usually so limited that we cannot give enough information. So the tip that they get, their mind 
uh, whoever gets the information is like, what are they talking about? I've not got it fully. They just reminded them, don't involve in sexual activities, don't get uh, couple, coupled you know, at early ages. But you find the child is asking, what is it that I'm supposed to do? Because time is not enough. You only give a tip and the child is left to think of the rest. So leave that time. And above all, the time invested in giving the right information at the right time with proper monitoring and evaluation, then SE will take root in schools. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm Brian. I don't want to, to add something. She has mentioned yes, about yes. Uh, how to, be, to, to remove the responsibility from the community. But I also thought that much as we may have the trainings of teachers, trainings of parents, that should not be enough to remove the misconception about sexuality. But I would think that if we, if we can have focal persons about PSD, who would always move, who would always move in communities, educate, decide, give proper information about sexuality, then they are also responsible in school, maybe to continue training teachers at their home schools, even if you be given time to speak to, to the learners during guidance and counseling sessions, or in during their, for their free time activities. I think these focal points or these focal personnel, they can also help to, be, to, to, to remove that misconception about sexuality and people can still understand more about what it means, but not only to be dwelled on, click on one of the things that sexuality means sex and teaching other people about condoms. But if we can have specific focal persons uh, given responsibilities in certain regions or in certain uh, districts and purposely to do that job, I think it can erase the misconception about sexuality. Because even the adults, even the teachers of science, my, like my sister who I said in Uganda that is a biology teacher, even the teachers themselves went to a topic about Female reproductive system or male reproductive system, for example, they teach it with shyness. It means that they also have <laughs> to teach it. But if they are also given the opportunity that when they're handling such a topic about reproductive system, they can see how they can integrate CS in that topic. They can see how they can go further to get it to prepare the learners about the proper information without fear. Only most, most of the biology teachers or science teachers. They teach reproductive system just for exam purpose, but they don't go deep to say about the benefits of studying, of studying that topic and how, how to manage their emotions, how to manage their behaviors, how the changes that happen from, from birth up to death, they don't go beyond that, but they just teach for exam. But at this focal part, person with the going community, because that would be his or her assigned daily duty. Would go to school, would speak to administrators of the schools or district level so they can have proper information about this. Thank you very much. Thank you so uh, much, Mr. Brown, for your addition. Um, Allow I'm me sorry. to. Yeah, I wanted just to, to highlight something. Um, um, we are talking about uh, CSE in schools, but uh, remember that it's time also for teachers to influence uh, decision makers uh, that they can uh, also um, uh, make easy for those uh, uh, girls and boys uh, uh, to have access to the services uh, in uh, health success, services, uh, like uh, if they want uh, to have those uh, to use uh, the contraceptives, to have access to condoms, to have access to when, when they have uh, some illnesses like STE, uh, they can go to hospital easily without have the parents uh, to go with. Uh, so they have to, to make it easy to access uh, the health services at hospital, especially in the CSE thing. Thank you so much, Ms. Regine. Can I ask you for the last minute, Ms. Regine and Mr. Brian, to prepare this question? I'll come back to you. You don't need to answer it now. The three key benefits of CSEs in schools. I want you to give us this message for our participants who are listening in and anyone that would want to convince our policymakers on the importance of CSE in schools, I'll ask you just to talk about the three key benefits 
of CSEs in schools. I'll get back to you and I'll give you just less than a minute. So I'm going back to Malawi. Ms. Wizi, I hope you're still on the call. What CSE focused areas would you want to strengthen and building your expertise in? What are the critical areas you'd want us to focus on for you to build your expertise under the CSE? Ms. Thank Wizi? you so much, Kembi. Thank you. Thank you. Like I said earlier on, that uh, the main challenge that I have, and which I've also noted in most of the CSE teachers, is understanding, broad understanding of what sexuality is all about. You know, in today's changing world, uh, growing up is not easy for our young people. And I believe the CSE can make that e a journey easier if we, we teachers are well trained and have a broad understanding of what sexuality is all about. Because area owner also mentioned that the CAC materials that we are using in schools, they don't provide a comprehensive typology for describing sexuality to our young people. So for me, I would rather uh, broaden my understanding on the sexuality and how it impacts sexual behaviors. Apart from that, we also have uh, a, a lot of cases of uh, sexual abuse in our schools. But as teachers, I think we, we are unable to tell in terms of the science and the like. So I would also want to build my capacity on a, a gender-based variety. And apart from that, um, we also have a lot of issues to do with the uh, development. And this is why we have a lot of uh, misconceptions about uh, uh, development in terms of adolescence. So I would also want to broaden my understanding on that area. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Glenn and Ms. Regine, in just one minute, what are the key three messages you'd want to give us in terms of the benefits? Okay, uh, for me, I would say that uh, CSE at school, uh, it will help students to gain, to get the right information. They have different information. They have these things that they tell them which are not true they have to get the right information from the right person without manipulation. A person can give you a message uh, and information, but be, depending on uh, what he wants from you or she wants from you, the information will not be true. It will be manipulative. Uh, so they need the right information from teachers, from uh, the school, uh, yeah. The second thing is uh, it's also a time for uh, uh, these uh, adolescents and these learners to, to, to understand their feelings. So sometimes a person can tell them, I love you, and uh, you know, you are beautiful. And the person, the, the child, we think that it's a love. They can get married. They can uh, uh, have their lives together, which is not true. They have to differentiate love and um, other feelings, like their bodies are feeling uh, they want to make sex. It's different from love and whatever. They have to, to know how to differentiate those feelings and to take decisions in their life. So this will link them to decisions that they have to take that will take them in the future. The last thing um, I, I can say, it's just to prevent early pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies, and uh, to prevent GBV at school level and at home. Because if the, the child understood everything in a good way, at home, she will also have uh, to protect herself or himself uh, from GBV. So uh, I can say it like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. We highly appreciate all the teachers that have shared their views and we appreciate the work that you're doing at community level. It really is yielding quite a lot of results. We acknowledge the work that you're doing. You are the key players when it comes to educating our children and our young people and adolescents. 
but we're also cognizant of the fact that you work with different multi-stakeholders in the space, the government officials, civil society, parliamentarians, that also has a contribution to this effect. So allow me to invite Ms. Tingoma, who is representing the civil society organizations, not only in Zambia, but also at regional level. Ms. Tingoma, welcome. May you respond to this question on what do you think is the role of civil society in supporting CSE efforts in Africa? Over to you, Ms. Tingoma. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the civil society organizations play a very key role mostly because they are a very in a very critical link between uh, or among its different government uh, departments and ministries uh, in areas where these uh, government ministries sometimes may not easily interface the civil society are able to transcend so civil societies will find their their foot in terms of their work within the education sector within the health sector within the social services sector within the protect you know protective sectors and within their their work they are able to interface and then bridge the gaps in terms of where gaps exist in terms of these governmental uh, departments and units so that is one the other aspect is that uh, civil society organizations are they have adequate dedicated technical support staff that are able then to enhance the work that the governments in the different uh, member states are actually doing so we would have a dedicated uh, people that are able to provide specialized but also focused non-specialized services within the, the, the area of sexual reproductive health, and of, you know, for instance. But also, they are able to then create a very clear linkage in terms of other service providers. We, as civil society organizations, are very... Uh, good in terms of a provision of advocacy and lobby. Mostly, one, we are able to facilitate account, you know, uh, foster accountability among uh, policy makers and other critical decision makers, but also ensuring a follow through to some of these commitments that are made, because commitments will be made. Uh, and if there's no proper follow through, non-confrontational in a way that is more helping because we want to find solutions then our advocacy then begins to bear to bear fruits but again there we are a, an effective conduit for for facilitating popularization of policy you know policy frameworks for popularization of certain practices making sure that there is a clear link between what is set out at national level to what is happening at community level where the, the, the masses of the people are. But also we have as uh, civil society uh, organizations standard in, in another better place to mobilize critical responders. Critical responders at different levels. We are able to, to mobilize critical responders at community level where the child, where the family is, these could be drawn from religious groups, from traditional leaders, from uh, local authorities, and building their capacity so that they are able to actually intervene where they are, but also create a very clear linkage with the next uh, level, the, 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 from sub-national to national level uh, linkages. So th that is a very critical role that I see uh, civil society playing with in, you know, in supporting CSE uh, in Africa. But also we are able to quickly mobilize ourselves because we, we do not have uh, some of the bureaucratic uh, impediments that, uh, that exist in terms of addressing some of the challenges that come uh, you know, in the implementation of CSE. So 
if there are misconceptions, for instance, we are able to quickly mobilize ourselves and then respond appropriately. But also where we notice that uh, there are members within ourselves as civil society organizations who may be providing uh, information that depart from said uh, legal framework, from said uh, policy guidelines, we are able to actually check that and then ensuring that the standardization of service provision uh, to the benefit of the child that we, you know, we all save. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. I also note that your organization is technical and has technical capacities in providing mental health issues. And do you also implement programs that cover such? So from your experience, uh, how can we prioritize mental health issues in CSE efforts to ensure that no one is left behind? Thank you very, very much. There's a very clear uh, link between mental health and you know, sexual and reproductive health and rights. This uh, link could actually be uh, seen that where there are sexual and reproductive health challenges, when there's a, you know, a pregnancy, a, a STI, they heighten mental health uh, you know, uh, dis disorders among uh, young people. In the same vein, when uh, young people are in a certain, their state of mind also affects the way they make choices. If they have uh, mental health challenges, it means that the choices that they may make will have, will be detrimental to, to their well-being. And when they are enjoying uh, positive mental health, they, they are able to make informed choices that then protect and sustain safe sex practices. And so in terms of enhancing mental health within sexual and reproductive intervention, we, we need to look at popularizing mental health so that we demystify mental health from mental illness and then raise this, this clear connection between sexual and reproductive health issue challenges and mental, in, in, in a mental health. The other aspect is to address the issues of uh, stigma and discrimination. So our interventions that we, you know, we, we deliver you know, across uh, Africa in terms of mental health within SRHR, look at popularizing mental health, making sure that there is a very clear demystification in terms of what mental, mental uh, health, il mental illness, and the enjoyment of mental health is, but also addressing stigma and discrimination. We have young people who fall pregnant. We have young people who are experimenting with relationships because they do not have adequate information. And when we uh, demean, when we stigmatize, when we discriminate against them, that then uh, affects their mental health, which then affects the way they make choices. And these choices then can then spiral the um, the negative uh, the negative uh, practice that then could be very difficult to deal with, but also provision of accurate information. We need to give young people accurate information on SRHR, but also access points for HR uh, uh, services and commodities. Because if they don't know where to get this, you know, these services, if they don't have adequate information and, and accurate information, then that also hampers their decision. The other aspect is promotion of mental health and psychosocial environment that are conducive for the uptake of SRHR services. These environments need to be enhanced within the school so that the school is very promotive, both from the social side of the school environment, but also from a physical side of the school environment. The psychosocial and mental health environment at the health, health center should also be enhanced because if young people go to the health center and the health practitioners begin to postpone on these children, on, 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 on these young people, then they won't be able to actually go back to seek these services. But also we need to enhance this same environment within the policing 
there are issues of uh, sexual, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, uh, sexual harassment. When a young person goes to the police to report, to seek protection, to seek support, how receptive and how responsive are these uh, police officers? So creation of uh, these enhanced uh, mental health and psychosocial environment is very, very critical in the uptake of sexual and reproductive health and CSE interventions. And also we're looking at uh, enhancing young people's health, help seeking behaviors that young people, once we build their capacity, they need to be able to seek help. And they only do that when one they've dealt with issues that they know I am able to seek help and I'll be uh, respected in my quest for help that I'm seeking. I am able to seek help and I'll be guaranteed the confidentiality that, uh, that is required. So these are areas among the many areas that we, we, we need to prioritize in terms of mental health within uh, sexual and reproductive health education. Thanks. Many thanks, First Ngoma. You have also just responded to the next question that I had, so I'm not going to be asking you this question, which was looking at the if, uh, how can we effectively contribute to the attainment of the community of practice objectives? I think you have also covered that. So, Remy, allow me to ask you to, sh uh, to share a video. We do have a video that we wanted to share with you with all our participants. We also want to welcome the participants to share any comments, any questions that you may have uh, to our guest speakers as the video is playing before we get to the expectations and the next steps. Over to you, Remy. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, please go ahead and show the video IT. Thank you so much, IT. And as Dr. Patricia has just alluded to earlier on when she officially opened this community of practice webinar, this is the very first time and the very first uh, opportunity for us to converge. There is going to be more recurrent webinars that are going to happen. So this video is just a summary of invitation to all the participants uh, to download the mobile app which we're going to be using as we go forward. We invite you to share with all the different networks and anybody that you think you might be interested in. So the last segment in the last 15 minutes, we hope to build consensus amongst all the participants. We want to thank all our invited guests that came and shared all their experiences and their technical expertise. We want to make sure that we build consensus on the way forward. The community of practice is going to be a very organic, engaging platform, informal as well, that will also bring some level of flexibility on the topics that you're going to, to be sharing with us that you'd want us to cover during the next webinars as well. So we want your full engagement and full participation in the structuring of the COP and the key content that we need to be discussing in all the subsequent regional webinars. 
and in the newsletters as well and what you want to see cover. So you see that the community of practice is going to be a fully consultative process. And we, we invite all the individual participants in this platform and the organizations to be members because once you are members like what I have shared before, you get more access to the content that will be generating as we go forward. So IT, if you can share the slides on the next steps, that would be quite useful. If you have any questions, please post them on the chat, in the chat box. So in terms of our next steps, we are going to be sending out the invitations for the next regional webinar. We hope that we can have one in December, just before the Christmas period, so that we wrap up the 2022 and also cover what we are going to be uh, talking about in 2023. So watch out for all the different posts that we're going to put via the UNESCO social media platforms and the group emails and all the other different platforms that you have received this invitation through. We encourage all participants in this webinar to register on the community of practice. You receive your membership number and you will receive quite a number of benefits as well as mentioned earlier and also from what our teachers have shared. We welcome submissions of ideas for publications through the newsletter. So we hope to have a monthly newsletter that will be circulating through the different platforms. And if you have any ideas, please feel free to share them through the, link, uh, the emails that you're sharing now to either Nigel or myself at maita.org. So make sure that you can share your ideas and any experiences that you are seeing in, at community level as well. One of the things that we are very strong with is a do no harm approach. So we assure you in terms of confidentiality, when you want to share a story about a minor or a young person, we will not publish their names and also make sure that there is a do no harm approach. We will start to populate the community of practice mobile app, the video that you've just shown. You will start to populate it right now. It's still just in a skeleton form. We were just enticing to show you that there's going to be a very interactive mobile app going forth. So we hope that this is still the formative stage and feel free to download the app, already place it on your gadgets and try to follow through the different links that are going to be uploaded from now on going forth as well. And um, we, our team is sharing the link via the chat box. So you can also see the link where you can okay. download the download app. So in the so next, in the next moment, moment. Sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Great, hello, IT, can you hear me loud and clear now? Yeah, we can hear you, I think the feedback is gone. Wonderful, thank you so much. In the next three minutes, I want to invite all participants in the on this platform to respond to some of the questions that we have put on a Zoom polling. So IT, if you can put up the Zoom polling, this is a polling where we are asking you the questions, uh, the questions and the topics that we'd want to see discussed during the next webinars as we proceed. So please, what are the, the top three priority topics you suggest for the upcoming webinars? Can you select three from these discussion topics? Just select three, I'll give you just a minute for you to do that. We want to build a webinar and a community of practice that is fully engaging and fully consultative. So please feel free to share your three most important topics you'd want to see discussed.
And while you do that, if you have any stories of change, any stories that you'd want to share from the community, or if you want to be one of our guest speakers in the next webinars as we go into 2023, we invite you also to write to myself and Nigel, and then we can reach directly back to you. And then we can organize for you to be part of the community of practice uh, presenters as we do the webinars going forth as well. Thank you, IT. IT, if you can confirm, do you show the results now or you're going to show them later after the webinar? Uh, we can, I can uh, download the results as soon as um the, we close the poll, then I'll share the, the results with you. Okay, wonderful. We will definitely send back to the participants. We'll write them back with just a summary of the webinar presentations and also give you the results of the poll. But thank you so much because you want to make this process as fully consultative as possible. We also urge all participants to share best practice models from your respective countries. If you have or you know a program that is really yielding results and is impacting the communities with regards to CSE, please feel free to reach us as well because what we want to do is to build consensus and also to try as much as possible to share all the best practice models at regional level so that we build the capacity of the practitioners that are going to be on the ground. So we really want to hear your stories, your examples, policy related as well. If there are any new policies that are coming through your parliaments, do feel free to share with us and even use letter articles that are relevant. Thank you so much for participating in this instance. Allow me to uh, call back Remy for the vote of thanks. Remy. Um, all right, uh, thank, you. thank you so much, Tembi. Uh, and thank you for really facilitating that uh, insightful panel discussion. I think a lot of things uh, came up from uh, you know colleagues working at the country level in terms of the challenges uh, experienced when dealing with issues around sexuality education. You know how to mobilize communities and gain uh, garner support from all stakeholders, uh, but also how to make sure that there's the CSC that is provided for uh, has uh, you know good quality and is able to transform young people's lives. So thank you. I really enjoyed that panel discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the close of our launch, the webinar. I would like to uh, expressively thank. Uh, Ms. Lindy Wetlamini, our keynote speaker, for gracing this occasion and also for providing the keynote uh, address earlier in the morning. I'd also like to thank Tembi and the Maita group colleagues for uh, supporting the, the creation of the community of practice. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, who spoke earlier on the panel and shared their experiences as well as their knowledge. I'd like to thank the UNESCO regional team uh, under the leadership of Patricia. Thanks uh, to all the IT colleagues that are working behind the scenes, colleagues in the regional team that have been assisting in responding to some of the questions uh, in the Q&A. Thank you to uh, the UNESCO country teams who have mobilized. We had over 189 participants, um, you know, tuning in for this webinar. And I think it's many thanks to your effort in mobilizing uh, different colleagues at the country level to be able to tune into the webinar. Uh, many thanks to the development partners, to the civil society colleagues, young people, and from those youth movements who have been part of the webinar. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank everyone who tuned in today and wish you a wonderful uh, remainder of the week and hopefully looking forward to, to seeing you on the next, uh, on the next webinar. Uh, enjoy your day and uh, goodbye from us.
Bye. <laughs>